We worship you in this place this morning, Lord. We thank you. We thank you for this freedom, this precious privilege. And Lord, everything that we sing is true, whether we sing it or not. Hallelujah. And we just thank you again for the special privilege of, of acknowledging who you are, Lord, that what we understand of who you are is already magnificent. You are King of kings and Lord of lords. We thank you that the name of Jesus Christ is the name above every name. We thank you for this special season where faith is required Lord, where we don't always see see you face to face and see the crown on your head and we don't always see you sitting on your throne Lord but we choose to believe we choose to know that that's true and to live our lives accordingly Lord to to submit to your lordship to seek you to seek the leading of the Holy Spirit Lord we want to be sheep that hear your voice and we thank you, Lord, that there will be a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. We thank you that you are merciful to forgive us of our sins, that you came and died on the cross. We thank you for your gift, Lord. We, we pray, Lord, that you'll help us to repent, that you'll help us to be obedient to you, and we pray, Lord, that in the time that's remaining, that you, through the power of your, your word, through your, your spoken word, your written word, your gospel, through our testimonies, Lord, that others would come to submit themselves before you. Lord, that even when you give us crowns like the elders, we would place them at your feet to truly submit to you in every way. And I pray, Lord, for your blessing over the teaching this morning, and I pray, Lord, that you will anoint me. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, y'all can be seated. Give me just a moment. All right, so we're continuing. The great I am's good creation. And I believe that the Lord threw me a, a, a little bit of a curveball this week in preparation, and um, which is a good thing. <laughs> um, so, you know, if we were going to continue along with the, I told you, I have, I reserve the right to change what's what's going to happen next week just because it was on the slide doesn't mean it has to happen it has to happen okay um so if we were going to go along with our pre-prescribed agenda i had just the simple word nasa on our list so this is our, our series this is where we've been the, over the last several weeks we discussed the physical world and how that's different than the spiritual world we discussed the gap of time between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2 and Satan's angelic kingdom. We discussed the flood and the potential floods. We discussed the firmament in good detail. Last week we went through celestial luminaries, which was a good one. I like that one. But so instead of just NASA, which I had planned on because... I'm fully persuaded. We keep asking ourselves which one is right between these two models because we live in a physical world, so there is a reality. There, there's, there's a right and a wrong. There's, there's one of these is at least more correct than the other, right? And if we keep going through scripture and we keep going through physical tests and they keep pointing to that the one on the left is right, but we've got this institution called NASA that has got some pretty pretty pictures, some cartoons that they make that look pretty good. 
and they've got a, a large marketing campaign, a large, large budget for marketing, and they keep pointing to the one on the right. Right, so I planned on, this is, we have to address this in, in our series, rather than just, you know, there's, there's counterfeit $100 bills, right? And so the way that you know what a real $100 bill is, is you spend more time memorizing what's the real one, right? So I, I, we're not going to spend a ton of time focusing on that which is false because we've all been indoctrinated with all of these lies from, from the beginning of our lives. So we're already pretty familiar with, with the propaganda. But since, this, since NASA is such a powerful mind control manipulation tool of Satan to persuade people to believe the lie of the model on the right, we gotta talk about because we're gonna expose, expose the wolves. Right, bring bring these lies into the light. So that was my plan. I was like, we're going to go through and um, show a lot of the NASA fails, show where you know the science breaks down, show videos of you know astronauts falling over, and then you can see wires pulling them back up, and just all all of the green screen technology and all of the tomfoolery that is just exposed constantly, like it's bad. You would think with all of the money that they have that it would be crisp and it would be like foolproof. And it's gotta be that either they think it's funny or that God is allowing them to just mess up so that it would be plain for us to see, right? But so as I was, literally as I sat down and I was gonna pull up my, my presentation and I was gonna start working on NASA, it was just gonna be called NASA. I kept hearing lords of NASA, like lords of NASA. So then I started trying to think about, okay, well, what could that mean? And it can mean several things. So today is actually going to be called lords of NASA, not just NASA. And we're going to go through that. So um, I'm trying not to keep everybody here three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 hours at, uh, on a Sunday. And so I'm trying to heed counsel of some wise brethren that say it's okay to split things into multiple parts. And I felt like we already had like a really long series, so I keep trying to squeeze everything into a week, especially on topic. But we're, Lord willing, we'll probably have two teachings on NASA. Today is going to be Lords of NASA, and next week will probably be an expose of NASA and all of their tomfoolery uh, to bring all of the all of their shenanigans into the light to expose the, the tricks of the sorcerers, right? Um, and really, they are such a powerful agency that maybe they deserve two weeks. Maybe they deserve two weeks. So anyway, today, Lords of NASA, and then we have still much remaining in the series. Praise God. All right, so before we, before we jump into it, what time is it? Series intro time. Let's do it. fun i am getting my money's worth out of that fiverr video y'all like how it's got dolphin sounds even though it's sharks <laughs> uh, so ghetto i am from atlanta so all right so lords of nasa what is a lord okay so <clears throat> as i was as i was reflecting on this whole topic lords of nasa I think that this is that there are several angles that you can look at this that are all true. 
Like there are people and spirits that are in control at NASA. NASA is also in control of a lot of people, like employees and just the citizens of the world, right? So they're lording over NASA. And then full circle, at the end of all of that, it's like, you know what? You know who's ultimately still the Lord of NASA? is the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So there's several ways that we can look at this. And, um, you know, part of, I think, what, what spurred on s- at least some of this is recently I had this, uh, this Facebook person. <laughs> Those people. She um, has, bless her heart, started off on a good track a couple years ago. She was, uh, I thought she was one of the ultras. Remember our ultra, ultra Christian? Um, but unfortunately, some of the people that start out on that ultra path, they end up getting lured into Torah and um, observing feasts. And she has gone so far as to say that literally the only name that you are allowed to refer to the most high is the most high that if you say anything else it can't be god it can't be lord it can't be that if you say anything else that you are an idol worship and she was like you know you seem like a real cool guy but you're obviously a servant of satan because i used the word lord say so yeah. i'm like because lord means Baal. okay and so there's some confusion about that so At the beginning of this teaching, we are going to focus a little bit more just on the word Lord. Do you think it's possible that we got some definition time involved? We got some definition time for you. Just not a a lot, not near as much as normal. We got a little bit of definition time to unpack the word Lord and to, um, to clear up the confusion that some of the church has right now. Because yes, there are places where the word Baal means Lord. So I'm going to unpack all of that today so that hopefully... If there's anybody out there that's feeling conflicted over saying the Lord Jesus, that after today, that, that uh, bondage has been removed from you and you now have peace and joy in your heart. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> People are crazy. People are crazy. So here we go. What is a Lord? So if we just pull up the definition of a Lord, A Lord simply means someone or something having power, authority, or influence, a master or a ruler, okay? So in the United Kingdom, a Lord is actually a a man of noble rank or a high office. It's a formal title that's given to a baron. It's uh, also the the House of Lords is part of the uh, parliament in the UK, right? It's also a courtesy title given to a younger son of a duke, um, what else? Titles of people in authority. You know, I, I like how, <laughs> I don't like, I hate it, that the very last one that they begrudgingly include in there is, they, they like whisper like, uh, a name for a God or Christ. <laughs> like, man, how come that's not the first one? <laughs> but hey, they, they included it. So <laughs> praise the Lord for that. Every tongue will confess, right? So Genesis 2, 1 through 4, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And so there are tons of places where the word Lord shows up in the Bible. And we're going to go through a few of them today. Anytime you see all capital, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that is Lord God Almighty, the Father that it's referring to there. All right, so when we get to the, when we pull up the all caps, the Lord, that's the H3068. And how do you pronounce it? Jehovah, Yehovah, Yehovah, Yahuwah, Yahweh, how, which one's right? Nobody knows. Where's your heart at when you're pronouncing this? Um, are you are you in a spirit of pride 
a spirit of judgment of others? Or are you really just focused on that he is the existing one? Right? He is the one who always was. He is the great I am. So lots of names, but when you see that, and so I guess people end up with a beef over the fact that there was a translation, but the fact that there was a translation came from a place of reverence because people said, we don't know how to speak the name of the Most High. So rather than try to get a pronunciation correctly, we're just going to say that he's Lord. Because it is, is it true that he's our master? Should it be true that he is our master? Yes. So it's, a, it's, it's from a good place. It's from a place of reverence. And so if we come back here, sometimes when we're doing this uh, definition time and you'll, you'll, you'll pull up a, a definition, you'll see where it says, like under, under here, the proper name of the one true God, unpronounced except with the unpronounced. So this is why they, they didn't feel like they were okay to pronounce it, but unpronounced except with the vowel pointing is of H136. So sometimes we should continue searching. So H136 is Adonai. So what does Adonai mean? Lord, my Lord. It's a title spoken in place of Yahweh in, Jewish, in a Jewish display of reverence. So is it okay to say Adonai? Yeah. It's okay to say Adonai. It's, a, it's a, from a place of reverence. And so the Adonai is an emphatic form of H113. What's emphatic mean? Uttered with or marked by emphasis, tending to express oneself in forceful speech or decisive action, attracting special attention. Okay? So when we see, so okay, okay, we got to follow the trail there. What's that H113? The H113 just simply means Adon. So here is the word Lord, which means Adon, which means firm, strong, Lord, a master. It can be in reference to men, a superintendent of a household or affairs, a master, a king. It can be in reverence to God, but it can also mean earthly. Somebody who's in charge of others and in charge of, they have responsibilities. And other people are depending on them and looking to them for decisions and looking to them for leadership. Lords, kings, reference to men, master, even just the word husband, it's used as, as husband in many places. Governor, prince, king. So the word Adon is really just a, a word that means any person that is in charge of others, right? And so when we come back then to what is Adonai, that means Hey, this one is special, attracting special attention, marked with emphasis. So just because there are men who have, men and women who have been delegated some authority to Lord, to have responsibility for others, they're held accountable for how they're, you know, how responsibly they're stewarding that responsibility. Does the Lord God Almighty still have responsibility and authority over all of us? Yes, to the same degree. No, much more. He's special. But it's still, it's just a title. It's like a, a descriptive term of what is the relationship between this person to this person. Well, this person has some authority and responsibility over and for and to care for the other. So Adonai is special Adon. And, but there's tons of examples of Adons. And man, if this doesn't throw a, a monkey wrench in, in some of these people's uh, theology that want to complain about this, we know that the word says that the Lord hates Esau. I, it might be the only person that I can, it's the only one I can remember right now that the word says the Lord hates Esau. Like, man, it's really bad to be Esau. But Jacob called Esau his Lord. And he commanded them saying, thus shall you speak unto my Lord Esau. Thy servant Jacob saith thus, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now. So, Jacob was scared of Esau and he was sending his servant to go be like, hey, uh, Jacob's over here. But when you go over there, tell Esau 
that he's my Lord. So Jacob was saying, look, I am Esau. I'm sorry <laughs> that I just stole your birthright. Please don't kill me. You have authority over me. I am submitting to you. There's, and so do we serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Yes. Does this mean that Esau is our God? No. That's a lowercase L-O-R-D. That's an Adon, right? So let's address, the, uh, let's address this whole thing. Does the word Lord equal Baal? So there's, there's actually several different Baals in the Bible. If you, if you search them out, if you, do, if you spend a little bit of definition time with your morning coffee or whatever. So this H1120 is the Bamoth, Bamoth. And it came to pass on the morrow that uh, Balak took Balaam and brought him up into the high places of Baal, that thence he might see the utmost parts of the people. So this Baal just means the high places. This is not even, ref it's not referring to a deity. It's not referring to a person that has authority over anybody else. It just means heights. A, a place east of the Jordan. It was, a, it was a high place that they could go and look out over the people. Okay? So definition time. You got to unpack the word sometimes. There is another one. H1168, Baal. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. Okay. Well, now we're into the bad one. Okay, so it would behoove you if you're studying and trying to uh, formulate a theology from which to, you know, conduct your life and to, con you know, to, 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 to determine what uh, you believe is an acceptable way to worship the Lord and pray to the Lord, pray to, pray to the Most High. It would, it would behoove you to study out the words because there are many places where this word Baal does mean the supreme male divinity of the Phoenicians or Canaanites. Okay? So do we worship Baal? No. No, we don't worship this H1168. We rebuke this false god. Okay? But is that the only one? No, there's another one. H1167. This just means owner, husband, or lord. Uh, rulers, lords, a master, husband, what else? Chief man, captain, confederate, a person, <laughs> a horseman. So there's several different words that were translated. And so we, we, I appreciate the King James. I keep telling everybody, read this one over the other versions. I still think it's the best one. But... This is still English, and that was Hebrew. So there was a person who was responsible for translating, and sometimes they just called something something, and uh, you got to dig into it to see what something they were referring to. <laughs> okay, so there's several different Baals. And the word Baal is not always referring to that Phoenician Canaanite god. It's just not. And then we're told in Deuteronomy 10, 17, for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God and a mighty and terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. And where I had to look that up because I was like, what do you mean reward? He, don't, he doesn't get like participation trophies or what does that mean? It means that he can't be bribed. So he's just. He's just is what that means. But if you look up this Lord of lords, it means Adonai of Adons. So it doesn't mean that there aren't it's acknowledging that there are other entities, other created beings that are lesser than the creator who have some authority over others. But you know who's in charge of all of them? The Most High. And this is a good thing. So celebrate the word Lord. Celebrate the, you know, give praise to the Lord of Lords. And then Revelation 17, uh, 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And it's the Kyrios of Kyrios, if you look that up, because now we're in the Greek instead of the, the Hebrew. So I gave you an Old Testament one where we see all caps 
And that's God the Father, the Alpha and the Omega. And then what do we see in, in uh, the New Testament? It's the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? Lord Jesus. And then He's Lord of Lords and King of Kings. So again, this is back to our Emmanuel that Jesus was actually God with us. But over and over and over again, like really, these, these poor Poor truthers. Like, you have to understand. Yes, have we been lied to? Yes, are there institutions like NASA that have insane amount of resources? Are all of the kings of the earth in on it? Yes. And so we're like, okay, everything's a lie. And then you start hearing words that are exposing some of the lies, and you're like, yes. And then you listen to everything that that voice then has to say. And do you not think that it's possible that the most brilliant enemy that we have is willing to try to infiltrate the truther movement to do what he can to give you some truth and then take you away from the Lord in, in any degree that he can. Steal away the joy that you have from acknowledging that he's your master. Oh, bless these truthers. All right, so here's this curios. So this is the, the New Testament, um, you know, the, the Greek word for Lord. The curios. He to whom a person or thing belongs, about which he has power of deciding. So like I am the Lord of my truck, because I can decide if what I'm gonna do with it. All right? The possessor or disposer of a thing. Uh, is a title of honor ex expressive of respect and reverence, which servants with which servants greet their master. This title is given to God the Messiah. So, you know, you just have to throw so much of the Bible away because you heard, oh, uh, the Lord equals Baal. So now anywhere that, the, that you see the word Lord, that's actually Satan worship. No, what kind of... It's sad, but it's weird. <laughs> yep. And this is the, the blue letter Bible. Bless their heart. All right, and then the king of kings. A leader of the people, prince, commander, lord of the land, king. So this, uh, it's Basilius of Basilius. So that there's not like a separate word. It's just saying the king of the kings. It's still distinguishing that, that God is. That there are other leaders of people. Do we have leaders? Yes, we have leaders. Are they on the same level of respect and reverence that we should know. <laughs> uh, it's silly that we have to even cover this, but we're doing it. All right, so let me ask you a question. Which one of these is a father? The man on the left has one son. The man on the right, he was a father of 89 children. He was at one time, at least, the world's most prolific dad, but he's died. Are they both fathers? Yes. So the title of father is true for both of them. Does one of them have a greater responsibility than the other? Yeah, this guy's in charge of 89 people. He has to provide for 89 of them. This guy has one person that he needs to look out for. So that's all that's going on with this, this term Lord is that there are varying levels of responsibility that one has as a Lord. You, you know, and if you show that you're responsible, you know, that you've been responsible with one, it's likely that you're going to level up and have more people that are then depending on you. Not always, but. All right, which one is a president? So the. You know, successful young man on the left was the student body president at Florida State. He still has the title of president. He's the president of an organization. This other guy, I don't even know his name, but he was a president of uh, the Alaska Pipeline. So this guy is in charge of many more resources. They both still have the, the, the title of president. So which one of these is a president? <laughs> <laughs> we're uh y'all oh goodness y'all know it's it's uh 2024 right bless all of our hearts 
this year is about to be crazy. Did y'all see, did you see the, uh, who knows if it's true or not, but you see that the, uh, the Nephilim showed up at the mall in Miami? Y'all see that? If so, it's got to be like some teenage Nephilim. They snuck out of the house. They weren't supposed to. They went to the mall. They're probably getting reprimanded. They're grounded right now. No. Now, could it be scrubbed? Absolutely. Do they control everything electronic? Absolutely. Could it be true? Absolutely. Could the whole thing just be a psyop and messing with people? Sure. But, man, you know they turn everything up on, elect- on election years, right? So... God bless us and help us. This, this year is, uh, I'm not going to speak a curse over it. I, I pray that this year is the best one yet Amen. for all of us. Amen. Amen and hallelujah. And that righteousness will prevail and that uh, the votes count. You know, and as we get closer, I'll be encouraging everybody to actually still vote. And I'll go through a teaching on that. But I do have a couple of uh, reflections about this. It's not just a joke for me. But that as we're considering the title of Lord, that it's a title right, that can apply and that there can be varying levels. And that why would then there be any confusion or any possibility that the word bail could be a good thing and it could also be a bad thing? Well, could it be possible that Satan, who wants to be like the Most High, has tried to co-opt the name? It's like, you'll call me Lord. Like, is that is that hard to believe that he would be like... It's like uh, Black Lives Matter. Do Black Lives Matter? Absolutely. 100% truth. Did some communist Marxists steal that name so that people would be like, oh, we can't disagree with anything else that you say because Black Lives do matter? Yeah, so they co-opted the name. They stole a name that they didn't really have right to. So, you know... I'm going to try to upload this to the social media platform, so I can't probably be... I'm going to have to edit the video. if I, you know, I don't want to take the time to edit it. So um, <laughs> just get, get it over with. I'm already on probation with them right now because I, I mentioned an injectable jibbity-jabbity thing that people may have taken and suggested that maybe they should repent. God help me. Um, but anyway, whether or not somebody believes that the man who's in office now currently actually legally was uh, earned the votes for that. He's still got the name tag that says it. He's still sitting in the chair. Many people are in agreement about calling him that. So he, Joe Biden has the title president, whether he's legally morally actually the president or not he still has he still has that title so in a similar way just because satan is not our lord there are people that call satan lord so that does is satan lord yes of some people you know and you know give me the choice between the two of them i'm taking i'm taking mr orange man Um, But is he a perfect representation of who I think a president should be? Absolutely not. Is it possible that he's just part of the whole thing? Yeah. Yeah, he's he's in the club, right? Um, But again, as we get closer to the elections, I'm going to encourage everybody to vote and vote for, even if they're lying to you, you vote for the one who's telling you what, what should be true. And then if they're lying to you about who they really are and they're lying to you about what they're really going to do, then they're bringing curse upon themselves. But you don't disengage because what happens if your vote does count and now you didn't didn't do your part. So, you know, there's so much to unpacking just the, the truth of titles and the responsibility of titles. And, um, you know, we should be praying for our president. We should be praying for, you know... President Biden, I was about to just, you know, defame the man. I'm just, you know, we, we got to try to speak some, some blessing. <laughs> okay. Let's pray that the Lord will work a miracle and that he'll just be like, you know, da-da-da. I'm going to be a righteous man today and submit to the Lord Jesus. <sighs> um, 
But you know, we'll see. Maybe who lo- who knows? Maybe maybe this will will get into the hands of of some people that are in any kind of a position of authority or any kind of a, a position of uh, y'all better understand that even though you have authority over many people, and we're going to go through the lords of NASA, right? People that are in positions of great power and influence and authority. There is a Lord that is emphasized. There is an Adonai. There is a special Lord that is over all of the other Lords. And any authority that you have has been delegated to you. It's a terrible responsibility and a burden that you need to to carry with integrity. And if you don't, you're going to be held accountable. And um, man, man, there's this there's just only so much time left before you're going to be forced to bow your knee. And if the only time you're bowing your knee and submitting to the Lord Jesus is when you're forced to, after that, you're going to the lake of fire. So now is the the precious window of opportunity where you can submit to the Lord Jesus and live forever in peace. So repent. All right, so what is Satan Lord over? We mentioned that he is, uh, that he technically is a Lord, right? So it's in scripture too. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So who's the God? Lowercase g. That's not talking about God Almighty. That's Satan, okay? Um, and, you know, I wanted to point out here that, like, we get confused sometimes that most of the world is, like, not picking up on biblical cosmology and not picking up on deliverance and not picking up on the uh, baptism of the holy ghost and even the church right satan is able to blind them like he literally blinds them why because they believe not so the only hope that we have to not be blinded is first to do what to believe on the lord jesus to believe in his holy word so if you're christian who thinks that this is not true, you're probably blind. You're making yourself vulnerable. You don't have the full armor of God on you. And then Ephesians 2, 2, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And Uh, I don't want to antagonize the dude, but you know, sometimes I'm just, I've had enough of him and we got to just remind this inferior created being, the prince of the power of the air. He wants to be like the most high. If you look up even the definition in his title, this air means particularly the lower air (laughs) as distinguished from the higher and rarer air. (laughs) I'm the prince of the power of the air. Yeah, 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 that lower air. (laughs) Take that, snake. (laughs) All right, sorry, that was, that was, that was good. All right, Satan's lordship. (sighs) A couple more titles of Satan where it actually points to that he is, he is a lord. Are these some titles that he should be proud of? We'll see. And Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go, inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. Second Kings 1, 2. So this uh, Baalzebub. So there's a Baalzebub. You can see it's with A's. This is the Old Testament uh, version of Baalzebub. And it actually is pronounced Baalzevuv. The B's are actually, uh, the the B's are pronounced as V's. But it means Lord of the Fly. There's a book and a movie. But Lord of the Fly. Just the most majestic creature to be a Lord of. And do we know why he's called the Lord of the Fly? Oh, it's so good. In, uh, In the New Testament, when we see Beelzebub, it's with an E. And, um, the Matthew twelve twenty four. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, "This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by but by Beelzebub, and it's actually pronounced Beelzevul, and it means uh, dung god. So the Lord of dung, 
So that's why he's the Lord of flies is because he's the Lord of, of poop and flies are all around him. So anytime, you know, anytime you want to just put him back in his place, like, okay, poop God, <laughs> enjoy your flies. All right, so remember that there are kings and rulers um, and that they're in on this. So we're, we're going to start to transition just from the teaching on Lord and the different definitions of lords into actually, t- actually talking about the lords of NASA. So why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. And then reminder about Romans 1, 18 through 25. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold, but remember that word hold means to withhold the truth and unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image make like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. You know, and we went through both of these when we were talking about the firmament and how the kings of this world have the resources and we've got ships big enough to where we can sail to the ice wall and Operation High Jump where they got out and started exploring and then they started trying to blow up the firmament. And so they know they've seen it. They know that there's a firmament. And they know and they're hiding that truth from us. And what do we see? If, if ever there was an institution that worships the creation, it would be NASA, you know? And then they're, they're trying to bring as many people along with them. And so we're going to go into the lords of NASA. So I mentioned this earlier, but this is a multidimensional topic that there are people and spirits in charge of NASA. NASA is also in charge of people that some people worship and submit themselves to NASA. Now, is there some weirdo that literally has like a picture of NASA up with candles around it and he's bowing to it? Maybe, probably in this messed up world world. But there are people that are still, if you're going to put, you know, um, a peer reviewed study from, you know, that, that NASA puts out next to the Holy Bible, they're going to side with the peer reviewed study. They're going to side with, you know, whatever journal publication comes out about this next supernova or whatever over the word of God. So is that a form of worship? I believe so. They're submitting themselves to the words that NASA is speaking and they're believing them over the word of God. And so they're submitting themselves to that and then that means that NASA has power over them. Also, about this Lords of NASA topic, when we break the mind control spells which were placed on us through, it's literally, it's witchcraft. When we break the witchcraft that's been put on us by NASA, they lose a tremendous amount of power to lord over us. I'm not going to say they lose all power because they're still in a place of authority. They still are getting 69 point whatever million dollars a day. They still have guns. They They can still enforce that you know i'm not allowed to go to antarctica and explore by myself so it's not like they've i've you know just by knowing the truth that now they have no power over us no they still have lots of power over us but they lose a tremendous amount of power when we know the truth and when we believe the truth we're not scared (laughs) how frequently do we see like a an announcement about there's a massive that's coming Ah, and people legitimately get scared about that and fear is produced they choose fear over faith and then what happens when uh, demons feed on fear you know so they lose all of that power when all of a sudden you don't believe anything that comes out of their mouth 
Uh, also, this topic, Lords of NASA, the Lord is Lord, the Lord of Lords is highest and ultimately still Lord over NASA. So I'm going to I'm going to keep drilling that one home today. And today we're, I'm just going to do a quick overview with the time that's left over the history of NASA. And then we're going to pray a prayer to break NASA spells on us and on all of humanity. OK, um, so again, I know that I spent a little bit more time of our time today just focusing on that that conversation about the Lord. But you know what? When I sat down and I had that inspiration, I felt the Holy Spirit on me and it brrr, I cranked all of that out quickly. And then I realized how much time it was taking. I just had peace about it. So for whatever reason, um, you know, I think that a lot of the people in because we're, we're teaching on flat earth, like a lot of people that are in that are open to this and they're doing research about this. They're like that poor lady who just believe everything that shows up in the truther circle and then they're experiencing the same fear and the same doubt and the same guilt that all of the unbelievers are experiencing over all of this fake truther stuff too. So, you know, I started out thinking I was just going to te you know, teach on NASA and then we're going to, you know, it needs to be this big. And I ended up just having peace at the end of all of this, you know, kind of like we were talking earlier that like Jesus is Lord over all of this. I'm not that worried about NASA. <laughs> so I'm going to keep, keep pointing us back to that the Lord of Lords is highest and he's still Lord over NASA. So next week, Lord willing, who knows? Because, man, a week feels like almost a month to me in this season right now. But next week, Lord willing, we will have a NASA expose and go through some of the NASA fails and uh, just expose some of their lies, bring them into the light. So I gave you most of this list before, but I've inserted some more information about NASA. So in uh, 1915, so a precursor to NASA was actually NACA, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. And they helped to uh, work on building better planes for uh, building you know, fighter planes for the, the wars, World War I, World War II, and just planes in general. And then we mentioned how Admiral Byrd, Admiral Byrd flew over the North Pole in 26. He began exploring Antarctica in 29. I inserted this one here because we need to know about the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and who started this. So we're gonna, I'm going to bring it all back in. I'm, I'm giving you the history of NASA, but some of this is important because of the lords of NASA and some of the founders of NASA and some of the people that have been in charge of this institution. So the Jet Propulsion Laboratory was established in 1936. 1945, World War II ended. What happened then? Operation Paperclip. We'll go, go, uh, we've mentioned it already, but we'll talk about it a little bit more. But I wanted to show you that I, I discovered this this week, I guess because I finally looked into it a little bit closer, but I've heard about Operation Paperclip. But did you realize that it went on for almost 15 years? That was a long time. <laughs> um, and do you know what was happening during that time? They were uh, interviewing them. <laughs> okay, all right. They were probably torturing them and mind controlling them so that they would be obedient slaves to the United States going forward, right? Thousands of them. Well, I'll show you. We talked about the uh, Operation Nanook, which was when they started bouncing uh, radio off of the firmament, off of the uh, ionosphere. Right? Operation High Jump, when they started exploring Antarctica. Project Echo was, was part of that same Nanook um, extension. Operation Deep Freeze is when they established the uh, <laughs> permanent military bases down there. Explorer 1 rocket launch. All right, so we're down here, we're poking around, we're, we're like, okay, there's this firmament we can't get through. We need to see if we can go up. We need to go higher, we need to go higher. So they start exploring with the rockets and expanding on the, the work that had been done through the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And then in 58, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, was officially created. They absorbed NACA, uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and all of the Nazis, all of the Nazi scientists from Operation Paperclip. Then the Antarctic Treaty um, is signed, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. Nobody else needs to go down there. <laughs> okay. 
And then they start trying to blow up the firmament when we saw the fishbowl, Dominic means of the Lord, so the fishbowl of the Lord, they were trying to blow up the fishbowl of the Lord with those high altitude nuclear weapons on these Thor missiles that had been built through the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And then the moon landing was televised. All right, so we're going to go through a little bit of this, but definitely not all of it. So Admiral Byrd, a lot of the truthers, they like champion this guy. And, um, you know, I'll, I will mention him at times. And some of the videos of him are uh, very telling. It's like, wow, this guy is saying that there's, you know, um, land on the other side of Antarctica. Maybe that's true. They're hiding land from us. But do the truthers know that he was like absolutely without question a hardcore Freemason? Y'all know Richard Byrd was a Freemason, right? He was an active Freemason. He became a master Mason. And he, he came up in Lodge Number 1 in Washington, D.C. Like, he's not just a, a little dude in this game. He was, he was deep in the game. Uh, he was awarded a gold medal by the Kane Lodge. He became a compatriot of the Tennessee uh, Society, assigned state membership. What else? Remember, numerous, numerous, there, there's some more stuff I'll show you in a second. But um, actually on his tombstone is the Eastern Star. So absolutely a Freemason. Here's some facts about him. He became a member of the Federal Lodge number one in Washington, D.C. in 21. He <laughs> apparently put Masonic flags at the two poles. The two poles, okay. <laughs> as close as he got to the North Pole, and then he just picked a spot on the circle. Like, yeah, 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 here it is. Took a picture. But he established a lodge, lodge number 777. You blasphemous fool. And then in 57, he died mysteriously right before the Antarctic Treaty was, was signed. So let this be just a reminder. If any alphabet boys or masons or anybody is listening to this, they're going to use you up and then dispose of you, especially if you learn too much. This dude knew all the secrets of creation. And so they used him for his skills in leading and navigating. And once they had all the information, he got to go. And maybe it's because if you read his memoirs and what you know came out about the North Pole, they're like, this dude can't be trusted. So yeah, he was, he was a Mason, but maybe just being exposed to that much truth in creation, maybe the Lord God started working on him. And he's like, I got to tell the truth about this, right? Because what do we see? That creation testifies to the mysteries of God. So you got to believe that the Lord was, was pushing on, on his heart. But anyway, he was a Freemason, so there was at least some level of control that was over him, and some level of manipulation is likely to be on some of the words that we've heard. So everyone, oh, Admiral Byrd said there's, there's land past Antarctica. Maybe not. Maybe that was to try to dispel the, the firmament, you know? So anyway, he's not just a saint. He's not, a, not your hero. But we got a couple other people. Who is this Jack Parsons guy? Jack Parsons was an American rocket engineer, a chemist, and a thelemite occultist. What? He's one of the principal founders of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the Aerojet Engineering Corporation. He invented the first rocket to use a castable composite rocket propellant and pioneered the advancement of both liquid fuel and solid fuel rockets. Like this dude's contribution to the rockets that we have now cannot be overstated. He, he was neither. He's a Thelema guy. He's an occultist. This Thelema was a, a, a new religion that was created by Aleister Crowley. And then he became like a priest in this thing and started like adding to it. And this book of the law that Aleister Crowley wrote, which we're not going into him because he's, he's not technically a lord of NASA. He's just an occultist. But he said that this voice gave him all of that to, to write down. So who is that? A demon, right? And uh, if you look into, I'm not going to talk about it because it's disgusting and we want to focus on that, which is excellent and praiseworthy. But some of the deeds of both Aleister Crowley and uh, Jack Parsons, they were into, you know, I'm not even, even going to say it. They, they would do certain ritual, uh, certain rituals in order to gain knowledge which is how 
Jack Parsons was able to come up with all of these new technologies. As witchcraft, demonic stuff. Yeah, you can. You yes, yes, yes. I'm not going to go into it, but you know, hey, uh, adults, search it out if you want to. And then this Operation Paperclip, we've talked about it a few times. I'm just going to give you a little bit more about it. Secret United States Intelligence Program, where more than 1,600 German scientists, engineers, and technicians were taken from the former Nazi Germany to the U.S. for government employee, uh, employment after the end of World War II in Europe. So between 45 and 59. Many of these Germans were former members, and some were former leaders of the Nazi party. Okay, when large numbers of scientists were being discovered, then special section subdivision set up this, <laughs> it says, uh, an exploitation section to manage and interrogate them. For 15 years, um, they established a detention center. And then the first rec secret recru recruitment program was called Operation Overcast, and then that ended up turning into paperclip. And that they would basically, as they were interviewing these people, they would put a paperclip on the ones that they wanted to keep. Um, what else do I want to say? That's it on that. Let's go to the next one. So that picture, let's zoom in on the picture a little bit. Who do we see there? President Kennedy, Vice President, who became president later, Linda B. Johnson. Who's that dude in the middle, though? in between the two of them, right between the, the president and the vice president. He must be important. Kurt H. Dabu, 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 Dabus, Mr. Dabus. Who is this Kurt Heinrich Dabu? He's a, a German-American rocket engineer and NASA director. Director! Okay, so we hear this and then people try to, to paint over it and say, oh, well, you know, it was... Uh, for national security, we wanted to make sure the Russians didn't get ahead. So, you know, what are you going to do? Kill all these scientists or put them to work? Okay, sure. You going to make him the director of NASA? The director of the whole thing. And if you read through here, you can see that he was, he was part of the SS. He was an SS officer. What is this? It was the organization most responsible for the genocidal murder of six million Jews and millions of other victims during the Holocaust. This is not debated. And this is who we, we put as the director of one of the largest departments in our government. This guy who contributed to murdering millions of people. And one of one Braun. We've talked about him a little bit. I'm going to give you just a little bit more about him. Mm -hmm. Same deal. He's a German aerospace engineer, and he was a member of the SS. Right? And I've got a video that I'll play for you where it try, they try to, to put lipstick on him. And I've got some comments about that when we get there. Um, but this dude was instrumental in the creation of NASA. He served as a director. He is inducted into the National Academy of Engineering. Chief architect of the Saturn V launch vehicle that propelled the Apollo spacecraft to the Turtle Moon. Allegedly. So anyway, I've got a, a little bit more about him. But did you know that he and Walt Disney were buddies? So they produced a series of films together. And I like this. Among other things, this suggests that Von Braun had enough free time to popularize a astronautics. Yeah, among other things is, uh, is a, <laughs> a mouthful right there. You can, you can draw some conclusions, you know, speculations about their relationship. But if... Oh, yeah, Disney was a hardcore Freemason and an occultist, one of the most powerful magicians that's ever lived. So Disney Von Braun collaboration. I've got a little video for you. So let me play the video real quick. The name Werner Von Braun is well known for two primary reasons, his groundbreaking work on rocketry that landed man on the moon and his work as a registered Nazi at a concentration camp under Adolf Hitler. But he's also known for a third reason, 
his work with Walt Disney himself. But how did a former Nazi rocket scientist end up working with Walt Disney, and what did they work on? Werner von Braun was born in Germany in 1912. He was a poor high school student, particularly in math and physics. That all changed though when he read a copy of By Rocket into Planetary Space. This novel was written by early rocketry pioneer Hermann Oberth and ignited von Braun's love of rocketry. Following Germany's defeat in World War I, the Treaty of Versailles was established. Among other things, this treaty was written to prevent Germany from developing weapons of war, but it did not include rocketry. Germany's work on rockets was extremely dependent on research done by the young von Braun, whose thesis on liquid propellants was kept classified all the way until 1960. Von Braun was immediately put to work on Germany's rocket program, with the aim of creating a rocket that could be used as a weapon. This work yielded the German V-2 rocket, the world's first long-range guided ballistic missile. The V-2 was constructed at the Nordhausen Dora concentration camp in central Germany. This work was done by slave laborers and was directly overseen by von Braun. Although there is no doubt that von Braun was a Nazi and he contributed perhaps more than any other to their advanced weapons programs, there is some controversy over whether or not von Braun believed in Nazi ideology. He claims that he was forced into developing the V-2 even while disagreeing with its purpose. While we'll likely never know the truth about these claims, there is one bit of certainty. Throughout all of his work for the Nazi party, von Braun was working towards one singular goal, human space travel. As World War II was coming to an end in 1945 to an obvious German defeat, the Nazi party was unwilling to surrender von Braun and his team due to the secrecy and highly advanced nature of their work. They were kept in the Swiss Alps and overseen by SS guards who were ordered to kill them if an attempted allied capture were to take place. Von Braun was able to convince the guards to let him and his team split up and hide in several of the villages nearby. Once they were let go, Von Braun and several members of his team escaped and made it to Austria. It was there that he had found an American soldier and Von Braun surrendered. After his surrender, Von Braun and his team were allowed entry into the United States and were expunged of their Nazi connections. This cleared the way for them to start working with the American government on their advancement of rocketry, a decision that came with enormous controversy. That controversy partly faded away with time, and in 1952, Walt Disney entered the picture. Walt Disney was very good at using film and television to increase public interest in certain topics, which was exactly what Von Braun was trying to do for space exploration. Together, they teamed up on creating three television programs, Man in Space, Man in the Moon, and Mars and Beyond. Disney and his studio served as the artists and animators behind the shows, while Von Braun served as technical director. Von Braun actually appeared in these episodes, which focused on explaining how manned space travel to the moon and beyond was actually possible. Even though we now have the theoretical knowledge to make a trip to the moon, it will be many years yet before our plans can fully materialize. However, let us imagine for a moment that the many problems have been solved and that after completing our space station, we are ready to begin our first voyage around the moon. With over 42 million viewers in the first episode alone, there is little doubt that Disney and Von Braun helped to ignite the American public's fascination with space travel. A few years later, Von Braun would go on to achieve his lifelong dream. While he didn't ever personally travel through space on one of his rockets, he oversaw the development of the Saturn V, the rocket that landed man on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. So, what do you think? Was Disney right to work with a former registered Nazi? And were Disney and Von Braun's collaborations crucial to the American interest in space travel that landed man on the moon? Let us know in the comments down below, and please be sure to like and subscribe for more episodes of Disney Declassified. Alright, so <clears throat> I included that for a couple of reasons. To show you, A, that they were buddies, and yes, they were working on this propaganda that influenced literally millions of people. Also, um, I, thought, I found it very interesting that you know they're, they're trying to, to paint him in a good light. And I thought about that for a second, because it's like, okay, is it fair to say that we, we know that he's a bad person? Maybe he was just in fear for his life. Okay, so you're only left with two options with Werner von Braun, or with any person 
who goes along with an evil agenda. Either they're in support of the evil agenda. Either he was a Nazi who was like, yes, we need to exterminate these people. And yes, murdering them is okay. And yes, uh, imprisoning these people and making them work for free to make this rocket thing for me is the right way to go. Either he was on board with all of that or he was just a coward, just a coward and still an accomplice. Still, there's blood on his hands. So either way, he's not a hero. Either way, he's a bum. And I included this also not just to point fingers at Warner von Braun, but to, to point fingers at every person that's in a position of authority right now. And if you know that something's wrong and you're going along with it, there's blood on your hands. And in the days that are coming, when Christians are martyred, and there are people that are in positions of authority that are granted a lordship over others. Whether you support it and celebrate it or not, if you go along with it, blood is on your hands. You're an accomplice to murder if you go along with it. Instead, don't be afraid of other wicked kings. Don't be afraid of wicked lords. Love not your life even unto the death. So let this be an encouragement, especially Christians out there. You get herded into some concentration camps. What are you going to do? Are you going to perpetuate evil on your brethren? Or are you going to stand even if it costs you your life? So that, that needed to be said. Bring this back over here. All right, so just a reminder that Werner von Braun, this captain uh, rocket ship man, he put Psalm 19 and 1 on his tombstone which is the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament show with his handiwork. Yeah, Amen and hallelujah. It's our confession, deathbed confession there, huh? All right, now, uh, <laughs> there's a conspiracy theory about Stanley Kubrick and I'm not going to go into all of it because I can't really substantiate all of it, but it's interesting if you want to go into some of the details. But I am going to show you a cl uh, the, just the trailer of Stanley Kubrick's 2001 Space Odyssey. So the conspiracy theory is basically that Stanley Kubrick was involved in, in um, helping the United States to fake the moon landing with, because uh, he's a, he's a, a film director. The new one that came out, yeah. Oh, the old one, you saw it when it came out? Yeah, so I wanna, I wanna show you a little bit of this. I wanna show you a little bit of this because I have some observations about this. All right, so y'all check out the uh, film technology that was available in 1968, which was a year before we went to the moon, <laughs> allegedly. Right? the most dazzling visual happenings. 
What did you think about those dazzling visual happenings? So a, li a little, you know, cheesy compared to today's standards, right? But a couple of things stood out to me as I was looking at that. I was like, one thing is that, hey, uh, we ab absolutely had the ability to fake everything. Another one, though, that stood out to me this week where I was like, they had the ability to, to make some pretty clear videos. So you're telling me mankind's greatest achievement and they've got these pixelated, terrible videos. And so we can laugh about all the NASA fail videos and stuff like that. And most of the time I just look, oh, look how horrible that looks. But I was reminded freshly this week that like we had the ability to, to take good quality videos at that time and just didn't, just didn't. Because why? Because if they showed you too closely, you'd be like, that's tinfoil and duct tape. <laughs> oh, such a joke. Anyway. Let's see. We're almost done. A couple more slides. Hey, oh, oh no. <laughs> oh no. Where'd that go? Uh, let's come back over here. Here we are. I'm back in the game. All right. And just as a reminder, I showed you this before, but look at these prophets. Just knowing what the globe looked like long before we ever went. There are lords, there are people in position of authority over us that are lording over us that have been manipulating and controlling us and promoting this lie to separate people from the Most High for a long, 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 long time. And they're still in power now. All right, two videos about presidents slash lords slash salesmen. And so I could, I, I could have brought in a video from every single president since Kennedy, but I didn't. I was tempted to. I brought you a, a video of Kennedy and a, a video of Trump. I tried to find one of Biden and I couldn't because, bless him, the man's brain is about as helpful as like a bowl of ramen noodles that's cooked for an hour and a half. Like it's, uh, I don't think he's given us a, a speech about NASA. I, I just, ha I didn't find it. But Trump sure enough did. And so I've got a, I got a couple of videos that I want to show you from our, our, most uh, powerful salesmen for these institutions. For NASA. The dramatic achievements in space which occurred in recent weeks should have made clear to us all, as did the Sputnik in 1957, the impact of this adventure on the minds of men everywhere who are attempting to make a determination of which road they should take. Since early in my term, our efforts in space have been under review. With the advice of the Vice President, who is Chairman of the National Space Council, we have examined where we are strong and where we are not, where we may succeed and where we may not. Now it is time to take longer strides, time for a great new American enterprise, time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. I believe we possess all the resources and talents necessary, but the facts of the matter are that we have never made the national decisions or marshaled the national resources required for such leadership. We have never specified long-range goals on an urgent time schedule or managed our resources and our time so as to ensure their fulfillment. I therefore ask the Congress, above and beyond the increases I have earlier requested for space activities, to provide the funds which are needed to meet the following national goals. First, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish.
America's vital interests in space lost out to special interests in Washington, except, of course, for the senators and congressmen here. They would never do it. Right, Dana? But all of that is changing. We know that. My administration is reclaiming America's heritage as the world's greatest spacefaring nation. The essence of the American character is to explore new horizons and to tame new frontiers. But our destiny beyond the Earth is not only a matter of national identity, but a matter of national security. So important for our military. So important. And people don't talk about it. When it comes to defending America, it is not enough to merely have an American presence in space. We must have American dominance in space. So important. Very importantly, I'm hereby directing the Department of Defense and Pentagon to immediately begin the process necessary to establish a space force as the sixth branch of the armed forces. That's a big statement. We are going to have the Air Force and we are going to have the Space Force, separate but equal. It is going to be something so important. General Dunford, if you would carry that assignment out, I would be very greatly honored also. Where's General Dunford? General? Got it? Let's go get it, General. But that's the importance that we give it. We're going to have the Space Force. One year ago, I revived the National Space Council and put exactly the right man in charge, and that's our friend, Mike Pence, who feels very strongly about this. And in December, I signed a historic directive that will return Americans to the moon for the first time since 1972, if you can believe that. Always remembering it's about that, but it's also about jobs and the economy. This is a great thing we're doing. This time, we will do more than plant our flag and leave our footprints. We will establish a long-term presence, expand our economy, and build the foundation for an eventual mission to Mars, which is actually going to happen very quickly and fast. One year from now, our nation will mark an important milestone in human history, half a century since Americans first stepped off the eagle and onto the moon. That was a big, that was a big day, right? In that magnificent moment, the American astronaut embodied the incredible spirit of America, the confidence of a cowboy, the skill of a fighter pilot, the ambition of a scientist, and the courage of a true true, brilliant, tough warrior. They bounded fearlessly into the unknown to be there first. They did the impossible because they knew that together, there is absolutely nothing Americans can't do. When we get together, there's nobody even close. Now we are ready to begin the next great chapter of American space exploration. This is a very important day. This is a very important gathering. A new generation of young people seeks to challenge, really challenge hard, to get their talent and their skill to work. And now we're giving them a forum and a platform from which they can put that genius to work. Legions of welders and metal workers, scientists and engineers stand ready to build a powerful, new rocket, and gleaming new spaceships. And that goes with all of the other things that we're building in our country. Our nation of pioneers still yearns to conquer the unknown. Because we are Americans, and the future belongs totally to us. Once more, we will launch intrepid souls blazing through the sky and soaring into the heavens. Once more, we will summon the American spirit to tame the next great American frontier. And once more, we will proudly lead humanity 
And that's what it is. It's humanity beyond the earth and into those forbidden skies, but they will not be forbidden for long. You're very important people. You have a great, great contribution. What you're doing has been incredible, but it will be even more incredible, far more incredible, because we are giving you a platform the likes of which nobody has ever been given before. I am a big believer. You will go out there and you will take that frontier, which is largely unknown by man or woman, and you will learn everything there is to know about it. And what you're doing is so important. Remember, economically, militarily, scientifically, in every way, there is no place like space. Good luck, General Dunford and the Joint Chiefs. I want to wish you a lot of luck with Space Force. But that shows how important it is. Congratulations on your tremendous success, but you're going to have far more success right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Okay, I know that was kind of long. Um, but several observations. I feel, and it might just be me, but I feel like the next guy should just get up and be like, you can do it! It's like a pep rally. You know, it's like it feels so salesy to me. And I watched enough of them over, you know, several presidencies. They keep promising the same stuff. You're going to get a shiny new rocket. <laughs> okay, how much do you want? Why? Uh, because it's there. What? We're going to spend that much just because it's there? Like, you know what else is there? Hungry mouths. Like, where else could all of that money go towards? And it's being extorted, and they keep promising. Werner von Braun was promising we're going to Mars, even. Like, it's the same promises over and over and over and over and over again. And I, I like that. He's, uh, we're going to conquer those forbidden skies. What? What? When were they forbidden? Tower of Babel, maybe? Oh, so God spreads out all the nations and confuses the language of man, setting us back thousands of years because we were trying to get too high up to the, close, to the top of the firmament, but we're just able to just explore wherever we, wherever we want with these rockets? No, the skies are still forbidden. <laughs> uh, anyway, they're salesmen, and I'm just going to show you why would they lie. The cheese. The cheese, y'all. Look at the dollar bills. 58. $89 million. That's so much money, right? In 58. 58? You know how much money that was in 58? But look at these numbers, how they grow each year. Yeah, you're, we're already in a billion dollars just within four years of NASA starting. This is just NASA. We're already into the billion dollar range. Okay? And then it just, it's exponential. It just keeps growing. Look at all this money. And every president gets up and like, sells the public on why this is so important. And it started from just like patriotism and because it's there to now it's like fear-based that we have to or we're unsafe, right? And it just keeps growing. Look at these budgets, y'all. NASA's budget. And they say we can't go back to the moon because it's a painful process to rebuild <laughs> the technology. Look at these numbers that just keep going up. Boom, 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 boom. Boom, they keep growing every single year. Well, there's a couple years they backtrack. That's when the Republicans really stand against that spending and they go back $500,000. <laughs> Look at these numbers. Look at all this. It's an unfathomable amount of money that is going to giving us those, what, what those little like marshmallow space chew things that taste horrible. That's, that's what we've gotten out of it. No, I mean, they're using this money that they're taking from us to mind control us further with better and better CGI, except they still are horrible at it. These numbers just keep growing, y'all. Boom, 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 boom. And I took the time literally to type all of these in because I found the chart, but you know what they did? 
oh, this is, uh, these numbers are in millions. So instead of having all the zeros, it just started with 89, right? Because why? From a sales standpoint, 89 feels a whole lot less than 89 million. So it said in millions, and then the numbers were 89. I took the time literally to type every single one of these out to show y'all the true number. So you're not, you know, you're not salesed over with the taken out six zeros. Right? Look at these numbers. And where do you think they want to go with this budget? To infinity and beyond, right? 25 million, uh, 25 billion dollars. Sorry, 25.4 billion last year. And again, the Republicans stood hard this year because Biden was asking for 27 and the Republicans stood hard and this is, we're not going to spend that much this year. We're going to spend less than we did last year. <laughs> 25 billion dollars. That's currently $69.3 million a day. What could we do with that? Everything. We could do everything with that. Just that. And then, good old President Trump, you know what he did? <laughs> How long did it take NASA to get up to, hold on, let's go back. It took them 60-something years to get up to $25 billion. And Trump was like, hold my beer. <laughs> he doesn't drink, but look at this. Space Force. We need a Space Force. 30 billion. Like, what's the next one that we're just going to make up? We need the extra super secret Space Force. And we're going to need another 35 billion. <laughs> what? And then where's this? Just, this is the quali quality of life of Americans. This is why food is, this is one of the many reasons why food is so expensive and young college students can't get their own home or leave from, you know, living with their parents or afford to get married. Look at all this money. And that's just Space Force. You had 25 billion with NASA. For what? They keep, pro and, we, and we can't even go back to the moon. What? What? So anyway, here's NASA. Here's their logo. And if you know, you know. If you know, you know. What is that little red mark? Wherever do you see two rockets that join into one? Nowhere. Oh, that's just the rocket. Oh, okay. All right. Well, kind of looks like a snake's tongue. <sighs> The serpent's bifurcated tongue. So when the serpent speaks, when Satan speaks, when occultists speak, there's always a dual meaning. And did you know that in Hebrew, the word nasa has two meanings. There's two different words. It means to deceive or to lift up. Like a rocket that lifts up into the air or the deception of telling everybody that we live on a spinny water ball when we don't. And I've got a couple of verses for you. Obadiah 1, 3 through 4, and we're about to finish. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. And so that hath deceived thee is the H5377. The, the, uh, what, i got to remember. There's two, two ways to pronounce it. One of them is Nasha, and one of them is Nasa. And I think that the deception one is the nasha. And then this next one, Deuteronomy 4.19. Unless thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the hosts of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. And these words, the nasha and the nasa, they occur in many places. But I just grabbed a couple of them to show you. And let's look at that, that definition. The nasha means to beguile or deceive, to mentally delude, to seduce. And so what does the word beguile mean? To charm or enchant someone. It's not just to tell them a lie, because that's a different word. That's called lying. This beguile, this nasha, is 
enchanting someone in a deceptive way so you're confusing somebody and you're making them believe something that's not true through an enchantment. What's an enchantment? To put someone or something under a spell, to bewitch them. So inherent in this word, nasha, this nasa, which oh, it's just a coincidence that they, okay, you don't understand how occultists work and the witches that are in control and the lords of NASA, which are also the lords of most government institutions, right? Because it's not just Trump. It's, it's the Bilderberg Group and BlackRock and all of the, the true lords of, of the world are the ones that are beguiling and decepting, er, deceiving us all through deceptions, through, through witchcraft. So again, in just a minute, we're going to pray a prayer to break these spells. And then the NASA, which means to lift, to bear up, to carry, to take, to lift up, to be lifted up, to exalt, to lift oneself up. To lift in a great variety of applications. To burn Anyway, so let's, let's pray. Let's pray a prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much right now for this day. I thank you for these last days, Lord, where wisdom and information, wisdom is, inc is increasing as information is made available, and we have tools available to test lies, and um, we're studying to show ourselves approved, Lord, and um, lies are being exposed and um, the, the lies which have been spoken in secret are being shouted from rooftops, Lord, and those that love truth, those that believe on the Lord Jesus, are not being deceived by Satan and his minions, by the, the lowercase l lords, the Adons. Lord, we thank you that you are Adonai, that you are the Most High, that you are the Lord of Lords. So right now, in Jesus' name, I just break every curse that's been spoken over your children, over humanity, over us specifically in this room, and anyone hearing, these, hearing this voice. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you will remove the scales from the eyes of your children. We break the spell that has been placed over us that we've all believed and accepted and that we've given power to and added power to those spells that have indoctrinated others through our language, and through just our belief and faith in lies, we break those spells and we repent of that belief in false doctrine and false lies. Lord, we repent and we ask you to please have mercy on us. Break these spells that have been spoken over us, that have enslaved mankind. We rebuke the lies of NASA and the lords of NASA. And we thank you, Lord, that that you are just and that one day you're going to judge this earth and the wicked kings and the lords of NASA. Lord Jesus, we just ask you one more time to set your captives free. Help us to help others to break the spell that's over them. Help us, Lord, to communicate in love and to communicate boldly, to give us courage to speak truth, to love not our lives even unto the death to stand firmly on truth, to not fear wicked men. May it be so in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, last verse. The disciple is not above his master nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And what's the context of this verse? Jesus was casting demons out of people and the Pharisees started saying, he's casting demons out through the power of the Lord of Dung. And so Jesus is telling his disciples, hey, if they say that about me, what are they going to say about you? 
And then he's saying, don't be afraid of them. Still speak the truth. So this message, this series <laughs> is not popular. These truths are not popular. And it may get to the point that, that the words that we speak, that the truth that we speak carry a death sentence. And if so, amen and hallelujah. Praise to the Most High. But we're commanded to still speak the truth about these things and to not worry about these Pharisees, the lords of Nasa, anybody that wants to threaten us to suppress our voice, we're still supposed to speak truth. Okay? So I encourage you all to continue to speak truth and be courageous in these last days. All right, and that's it. And I do have a worship song. Do you think I have a song for you? I do. And... Um, this one, I'm going to replay one of the songs from this morning. So we don't gamble, but if you had to bet, would it be the, the really exciting one, the very first one that I played? It's not. It's actually not. Um, you know, as I was wrapping all of this up, I just had a peace that he is the, the Lord of Lords. Jesus Christ is the Lord of Lords. You know, I, I thought about closing with like a really intense... Like, we're going to overcome. And then it's like, you know what? He's reigning presently. All of this is going through his hands. Everything that we're allowed to be tested and tried with has been ordained by him even, you know? So the song that I'm closing with is the third one called Reigning. He's reigning. And hopefully it's a little bit more familiar because you just uh, worship um, the Lord to it this morning. Um, you know, but... I don't know. I just, uh, as I was preparing for this message in the past, I've gotten more upset about these wicked people. And I had a little bit more of a peace just to know that the Lord is doing his work right now to bring his good creation into, into the fullness. And so praise him for it. So let's pray real quick and then we'll worship. Heavenly Father, I thank you again for this message and I pray, Lord, that you'll send your Holy Spirit to minister to us, Lord, that you will just drive out any fear, any unclean spirit, any lying spirit, any spirit that would prevent your children from knowing and receiving truth and any spirit that would prevent your children from worshiping you now. And pray it in Jesus' name, amen. We worship you in this place this morning, Lord. We thank you for this day. We pray, Lord, that you will lead us and guide us and protect us Put your armor on us. Be with us this week. Help us to stand against wickedness. Help us to do all to stand in these last days, Lord. And we pray that no matter what we're going through, we'll give you thanks, that we'll trust you, that we'll praise you, that we'll worship you, that we'll keep our faith in you, and that we'll finish the race. We pray, Lord, for the, the honor of bringing some others with us, Lord. So we just pray that you'll bring people to us, place a conviction on our heart to speak truth to them, to love them and to serve them, but to share your gospel with them. Help us to love not our lives, even unto the death. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Love y'all. Stay well and be blessed.